Now, in chapter 9, here we come to the famous story of, of Saul on the road to Damascus. And this is actually an event that most people, most Christians think like, this is where, where Saul gets saved, was like where, where Jesus, you know, um, speaks with them in the way to Damascus. So basically what happens here, just, just to get ourselves, get our feet wet in the story here, it says in verse 3, and as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. So he's on the road, he's on the, he was walking to the city. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. So this light shines down from heaven and just engulfs him. And it's just this really bright light that's just shining on him. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? So this is a miraculous event. I mean, this is crazy. Like he's, just, he's walking down the road and all of a sudden, boom, this light just shines down on him. And he hears a voice he's saying, Saul, Saul, you know, why do you persecute me? Because he was going there to get to, to, to persecute the church. He was going there to, to arrest the saints, to arrest the believers, anyone who called on the name of the Lord. He was going out there as he had already done in Jerusalem. He was going in, if you remember, he was hailing men and women, you know, basically said, hey, how's it going? And then he would just, just arrest them and, and um, put them in prison. And now he's going to do the same exact thing. He was getting authority from the chief priest to go out to other cities and just continually just go after the church. So he's on his way there. The light shines down. He hears the voice. And it says, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise. And go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So basically, he asks them, you know, who are you? You know, Jesus says, I'm Jesus, who you persecute. He says, what do you want me to do? And Jesus says, okay, I want you to go into the city, and if, then, then you'll find out what I want you to do there. He doesn't even tell them right here. Now, I want to go a little bit in depth into this, because a lot of people think that at this moment is where uh, Saul gets saved, or Paul I mean, in this chapter, he's still called Saul, but we're going to find later, his, you know, his name's changed to Paul. So if I, if I refer to him as Paul or Saul, it's the same person. And um, so try not to get confused with that because I, I'm really just used to calling him Paul and not Saul. But in this chapter, he's Saul. So, um, but it's the same person. There's absolutely no indication from everything we just read that this is where, Paul, where, where Saul gets saved. Because in fact... He's blinded. So because of the light, when, when he's done with this conversation with Jesus and the light's gone, he's blind. His, his, the people that he's with have to lead him by the hand into the city. And he's blinded and he doesn't eat for three days and three nights because he's just like, I mean, he's all shook up over this, right? I mean, anybody would be. It's a pretty dramatic experience. And um, we see zero indication that anything to show that he was saved. And actually, you know, the Bible always refers to people who are lost as being blinded. You know, the, the veils over their eyes or over their hearts. They can't see. They can't understand. And this is just, just you know, it's not like concrete proof right there, but um, we're going to see the concrete proof of when he actually gets saved. And it says in verse 8, you know, and Saul arose from the earth, and when he, his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. That's where he's blinded. Now, why am I even go, just, you know, pointing this out? Well, the reason why I'm pointing this out is because this misunderstanding leads to a false teaching that gets people really relaxed about going out and soul winning. And I've heard this personally myself, but there's a lot of false doctrine around how people get saved. See, what a lot of people would like to say in this story is that, well, because you got to remember, I mean, Jesus Christ is already dead, risen again, and just, he's in heaven, right? He's no longer walking around on the earth. Now, in Jesus Christ's ministry, he was walking around the earth, and he was witnessing the people. He was doing soul winning personally when he was physically on this earth. But I tell you what, Jesus Christ today is not walking around and physically soul winning and, trying, and preaching the gospel to people that they could hear and get saved today. It's not happening. That's why God has given us the, um, the ministry of the reconciliation. We'll get to that in a minute. But see, we have so many false doctrines floating around where people are just really relaxed about going out and the importance of getting people saved and preaching the gospel. 
We have false doctrines today like Calvinism that's floating around that ultimately teaches that, you know, we don't even have a choice in our salvation. And that's what they'll say and use this, this verse too, is that, see, God's chosen him to, to become a vessel. And it was, you know, like, um, they'll, they'll use this when they say that, um, this isn't my notes, but it's, but it's right here. When, when God is talking to Ananias, and Ananias is basically saying, like, he's saying, look, I've heard of Saul. He's the one going out and persecuting us. Like, why do you want me to go and, and preach to him and, you know, and go near him at all? Like, like, why are you sending me there, God? It says in verse 15, but the Lord said unto him, go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, for I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. So, Calvinists will, will like to use this because they're saying, see, God's choosing him to be saved and that's why he shined a light on him and just spoke to him right in the way to Damascus because he's choosing this person just to be saved. But here's the thing, that's not what happened. I mean, yes, the light shone, but Saul did not get saved because Jesus Christ spoke to him right there. It took Ananias to preach him the gospel and we're going to get into that a little bit. But see... I just want to expose Calvinism a little bit because it's such a wicked doctrine. And basically, now there's hyper-Calvinism and then there's just Calvinism. But the, the bottom line is, is that the, if, if you're not a hyper-Calvinist, it just falls on its face anyways. You have to take things to their logical end. I mean, if you're going to believe in something, the only thing that even, I mean, it doesn't really make sense, but you can't justify any form of Calvinism without just taking it to... to to the logical end of what of what you're believing, what you're saying. And ultimately what that's teaching is that God just picks and chooses who gets saved and who doesn't. So it, you know, if you imagine this, just to make it real simple, God just basically saying in heaven, you know, if you're just going saved, not saved, not saved, saved, not saved, not saved, saved, you know, whatever. Just just I'm sovereign, and this is usually like the throw on sovereign. It's like God's a sovereign God, meaning God can do whatever he wants. And is God sovereign? Yes, but the way that they're using it is, is basically to say that God just picks and chooses who gets saved and who doesn't get saved. And it's extremely wicked, and it's even it's a b bizarre perversion of who God even is to think that he just arbitrarily is choosing some people to be saved and some people not to be saved, just at a whim, and to burn in hell forever and ever and be tortured and tormented just because, yeah, that, that person, I just want that person to go to hell. No, this person, I'm going to save that person. I'm going to show mercy on that one. It's, it's perverted to think that God is, is that way and that that is the way God is because he's not at all. And the problem is that this view ignores tons and tons of scripture. I'm going to read some for you. The Bible says in Revelation 22, 17, it says, And the spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely. See, Calvinism teaches that ultimately we don't have free will. Because God's the one that's deciding. And they'll even say, like, well, when you believe on God, it's because God gave that to you to believe on, on him. Like, it wasn't your choice. Like, God basically made you believe. And what they're saying is that you don't have a will. Well, in Revelation twenty two seventeen, the Bible says, whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. That sounds to me like we have a choice in the matter. That sounds to me like if you want to, hey, you can take the water of life freely if you want to. It's not if God makes you or if God puts that in you. If you want to, you can get saved. The Bible says in 2 Peter 3, 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God is not willing. That means willing means he doesn't want God does not want anyone to perish. It's not his will that anyone dies and goes to hell. God is a God of love and he's a God of mercy and he's also a God of judgment, but God does not want man to go to hell. It's not what he desires for him. But he's a God of justice. So if people choose to refuse the free gift that out of love he offers everybody, if people reject that, then yes, they will end up paying for their sins in hell. But the bottom line is that he's not willing that he should perish. And the Calvinist believes that God's the one that picks and chooses who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. And it's wickedness because 
That's just saying that God wants people to go to hell, and he doesn't. The Bible says, the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. John 3.15 says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Again, anybody that believes sounds to me like we have a choice. Hey, if you decide to believe in him, you're not going to perish. You're going to have eternal life. John 7.37 says, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Hey, he's putting it out there. Is anybody thirsty? Come and let them take a drink. Any of you lost people out there, you want to get saved? Come right on up and get saved. Believe on me. And you will have, out of your belly shall flow rivers of living waters. That's what he's saying. In John 12, 32, and I, it is Jesus Christ speaking, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Jesus Christ is drawing all men unto him. The Lord is not willing that any should perish. God wants everybody to be saved. But the Calvinist false teaching teaches that, no, God only chooses some people to be saved. God only elects certain people to be saved. It's wickedness and it's foolishness. Don't get sucked into this false doctrine. I got plenty more. John 12, 46. I am come a light into the world that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not... I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. The reason why Jesus Christ came was to save the world. He wants the whole world to get saved. He doesn't only want some people to get saved. He doesn't go after the few people that are chosen to be saved. God wants everybody to be saved. Jesus Christ came to save the whole world. Now, is the whole world going to get saved? No. We know that people are going to die and go to hell. We know that people reject Christ. But God, Jesus wanted everybody to get saved. He wanted, he came to save the whole world. Just as in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Again, Jesus wanted to come, he came to save the world. God sent his son to save the world. God does not pick and choose specific people to be saved or to go to hell. God wants everyone to be saved, and that's why he wants us to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. That's why he gave the, the command, hey, preach the gospel to every creature. He didn't say only preach it to certain people. I'll tell you who you should preach it to. Preach it to everybody. God wants everybody to be saved. And there are tons of other verses that are in total contradiction with this false teaching of Calvinism, but I don't think we really need to see any more. I mean, that's, that was plain enough, and we're going to need to continue on with the book of Acts. But I wanted to point that out, and the whole point I'm trying to make is that there's a lot of people out there who do not go out and preach the gospel because they think that somehow, you know, maybe one way or another, they'll just end up getting saved. I mean, that's what people like to think. The people that don't go out and give the gospel, people just think that, oh, well, so someone will give them the gospel. God will make sure that they, that they hear the gospel. If God wants them to get saved, he'll make sure that happens. They just trust that, like, it's just, it's just going to happen. Because if God wants it to happen, he'll just, he'll just find somebody to go out and do it. No, you need to get off your rear and go and talk to that person yourself. If you're just sitting back thinking God's just going to take care of it, no way. It's just simply not true. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 18, it says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Ministry is serving. You're ministering to other people. You're going out and serving other people by the ministry of reconciliation. is reconciling them to God. They're not reconciled with God if they're lost. If Jesus Christ is not their Savior, they have sin in their life. They have sin that they're going to pay for in hell unless they get reconciled unto God through the blood of Jesus Christ. And that ministry has been given unto us. It says to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world, again, the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. When, see, God was in Christ. When Christ walked around this earth, he was doing that. He was reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, 
We pray you in Christ's stead be reconciled to God. Say, look, Jesus Christ can't be here right now. He's not walking around on this earth. He's not going around with, with his ministry talking to people like he did with the woman at the well and giving them the gospel. He's not doing it anymore. That's our job. In Christ's stead, we're his ambassadors. We're going around and we're speaking for Christ saying, hey, these are the words of Christ. This is what the Bible says. You need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and get saved. That's our job. But unfortunately, people like to take this story and abuse it and say, oh, see, God really wanted Saul to get saved, so he appeared to him away in the way, and that's how he got saved. And I, and I heard this goofing, and I don't know exactly where I heard this. Sometime growing up, it's his, it's his philosophy, and it's common out there. People will think that, oh, well, what about these people who never hear about Jesus Christ? What about that tribe in Africa where they haven't heard about him? Is God really going to send them to hell because they haven't even heard about him? Yes, God will send them to hell. Jesus Christ, through faith in his name, is the only way. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And you don't get some special out. You don't get some special chance after you die if you've never heard of Jesus. People like to think this. It might make them feel good to think that, oh, well, yeah, of course, God's going to give them a chance after they die. Baloney. That's not going to happen. That's why it's so much more important for us to get the word out to them. That's why there's missionaries. That's why people travel across the world or across the country or wherever to bring the gospel, to bring the light to people who are in darkness. Because if they're in darkness their whole life, I'll tell you what, when they die, they're going to die in darkness and they're going to know nothing but darkness. That's why we need to bring the light of the gospel into the dark places so that it can shine and that it can pierce people's hearts and that they can believe and they too can get saved. And because if they don't believe in this lifetime on Jesus Christ, they're going to hell. That's what the Bible says. The Bible says nothing about special exemptions. And that's why he's given it to us. And, and it's so much more important for us to go out and do it. Because if we don't do it, then yes, people will go to hell. Even in this story, even in this story where, where after Jesus Christ was, is gone from the earth and he appears and, and he talks, audibly speaks with Saul, he does not tell him how to get saved. Okay, he gets his attention, but he does not tell him how to get saved. He uses a man, God uses a preacher, a man, to preach the gospel unto Saul. And I believe that's in there very specifically for us to understand that God is not just going to step in to get somebody saved without using an, a, a human instrument, which is why he gave us that ministry of reconciliation. Look at verse number 17, because now this is where Ananias basically meets with Saul. It says, And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. So we see here, now there's not a whole lot of information, but turn if you would, keep your finger in Acts chapter 9, go to Acts chapter 22, because... Paul recounts this story in Acts chapter 22 of everything that happens here. And we're going to compare what he says in Acts 22 with what's written in Acts chapter 9. Because someone will say, well, that doesn't really necessarily say that, he, that, that Saul got saved based on those two verses. It just says he received his sight and then he was, and he was baptized. Right? So nothing's very clear necessarily saying that that's exactly where he got saved. Well, we're going to find the rest of the information in Acts chapter 22. And we're going to see clearly that, yes, when Ananias spoke to him, this is when Saul called on the name of the Lord and got saved. Look at verse number 12. We're going, to, we're going to read a little bit of the same story here. And then we'll end up comparing the two. Verse 12 says, And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me, this is, this is Paul speaking, and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, 
and see the just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. And now, why tarryest thou? So he starts off telling him, look, God's chosen you. He wants you to do all this work for him. Now, why tarryest thou? Verse 16, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So this is where he tells him, look, why are you waiting around anymore? Call on God and get saved so he can wash away your sins. And we know, and I'm not going to go into the baptism part. I'm going to preach on baptism on Sunday. But we know that, bapti that the actual baptism being washed in water, being dunked under water, is not what washes away your sins. So when he's telling them here, be baptized and wash away thy sins, he's not referring to the baptism itself washing away sins. He's telling them, he said, calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord is what's going to wash away your sins. That's what's going to save you from your sins, is calling on the name of the Lord. People did this all throughout the Bible. I've got a few verses that I'm going to read for you, that just, just to help you understand that this is what salvation happens. In Acts chapter 2, if you remember from Acts chapter 2, when Peter was preaching, he said in verse 21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Romans 10, 13, our memory chapter, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Psalm 116, verse 13, says, I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Salvation is constantly referred to as calling upon the name of the Lord. In the Old Testament and New Testament, we see the same exact thing. And I'm not going to go into, there's, there's plenty of other places that talk about this. Where, people be, where men began to call upon the name of the Lord in Genesis, that's when you get saved. And it says, how then shall, you know, um, you can't call on him in whom you haven't believed, and you can't believe on him in whom you have not heard. Again, Romans 10 goes into the whole um, the way that happens. But all throughout history, people call on the name of the Lord in order to get saved. And we see here in Acts chapter 22 that this is exactly what Saul did. Because he got baptized, he called on the name of the Lord, and I told him, hey, why are you waiting around? Call on the name of the Lord. Wash away your sins. This is where he gets saved. It wasn't in the way. God sent a man. God sent Ananias to preach the gospel unto him and to help him to get saved. And this is where we see exactly that that's what happened. Now, as long as we're in Acts 22, there's another thing that I need to point out here because people will take these two accounts in Acts 9 and Acts 22 of what happens here, and they're going to say there's a contradiction, and I don't want anyone to, to, to trip you up with this. Because there's no contradictions in the Word of God. The King James Bible is, is perfect. It's the Word of God preserved for us today. But people might come to you and say, oh, no, look at this. There's a contradiction in these stories. And we're going to look at this real closely. Okay, Acts 22. Look at verse number 6. And it, and it came to pass that as I made my journey and was come nigh unto Damascus about noon, suddenly there shone from heaven a great light round about me. Still about the same, right? Paul's walking in the way. A great light from heaven shines round about him. And I fell into the ground, verse 7, and heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Again, this is exactly the same. It lines up perfectly with Acts chapter 9. Verse 8, and I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. No problems there. It's in verse number 9, <clears throat> where it talks about the people that were with him. It says, And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. Now keep your finger there and flip over to Acts chapter 9, verse number 7, because this is where it talks about the men which journeyed with them. It says, And and the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. So there's two things going on here. It talks about them hearing or not hearing, or seeing and seeing and not seeing, okay? Now, we're going to look at the seeing first, okay? It says in Acts 22.9, it says, they saw indeed the light, okay? So the people with them saw light. In Acts 9.7, it says, they seeing no man. Okay, so there's no contradiction there. Obviously, they saw the light that came down from heaven, but they didn't see any man. Right? Very consistent, no problem. But now let's look at what they heard. In Acts 22.9, it says, 
or in Acts 9, 7, it says, hearing a voice. So in Acts 9, 7, it says they heard a voice, right? But in Acts 22, 9, it says, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. So which is it? Did they hear a voice or did they not? Well, there's not a contradiction here. If you think about it, okay, saying that they heard a voice, just, just they heard a voice. It's not the same as they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. The, the voice of him that spake to me is very specific. And what I, what I think this is trying to teach us here, there's a few different ways you can look at this and try to interpret it, but I, I think, I think the, the way that makes the most sense to me is that, first of all, when the Bible uses the word like hearing, it's not always talking about hearing um, a specific sound. It's referring to understanding, right? So like the Bible says um, in Mark 8, 17, And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes see ye not, and having ears hear ye not? And do ye not remember? He's not saying they can't hear any sounds that come into their ears. But he's saying they don't understand. He's like, You're, you have ears, but you can't hear what I'm saying. Right? Um, and he uses that in many places. The Bible, I'm not going to go through all of them. Um, it's, it's a pretty common thing. Uh, Jeremiah 5.20 says, Declare this in the house of Jacob and publish it in Judah, saying, Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. So he's talking about these people not understanding. Hearing does not always refer to just how your ears pick up a sound that is made. It, it can also be referring to the understanding of what you're hearing. So what I think is happening here is when it says that they, they heard a voice. Think about if you're, if you're like in a restaurant, if you're in a crowded area, you could be sitting down and you can hear voices around you, right? You know their voices, but it doesn't mean that you hear what they're saying. It doesn't mean you understand what they're talking about. You're just sitting there, and the noise that you're hearing is the noise of a voice. You know that somebody's talking, but you don't necessarily know what they're saying. It's a sound. It's something that you can discern just that much, but you're not really hearing what they're saying. So if someone were to come up to you and say, hey, did you hear what I said? You'd be like, no. You know, like if you're not, if you're not like talking to them or listening to them, be like, you, you could say, did I hear a voice? Yes. But did you hear what he said? No. So what I think it's saying here is the same exact thing. They heard not the voice of him that spake to me. So it's saying they didn't, like, like Jesus Christ was speaking to them. They didn't know, like, who was speaking to them. They didn't know it was Jesus. They couldn't hear what he was saying. I think the whole point is here is trying to get across is that, um, and especially in Acts 22, is that Paul's saying, like, look, I'm the only one that heard him, right? Like, the people that were with me, they didn't hear what was said. They don't know what Jesus said to me. And that's why in Acts chapter 9 it said they heard a voice, but they saw no man. It was just like, that sounds like a voice. Does that make sense? And, and, and see, people will try to trick you up and say, no, see, there's a contradiction in the Bible. There's no contradiction at all. It's just, it's just understanding. And you use the Bible to interpret itself. And when you see many places, like I, I, write, I pointed out to there's a lot of other places that talk about having ears and not hearing, you know, having eyes and not seeing. This is the same type of thing that he's talking about. It has to go with understanding. They heard some kind of a voice, but they didn't understand anything about it. And Paul's, and Paul's just saying, look, they didn't hear what he said to me. So don't let that confuse you. And just uh, hopefully I'll give you a little bit of understanding here if anyone ever does bring that up to you. Because it's, it's, it's really not that difficult. But if you're not, you know, what, what people like to do... And when they're trying to trip you up, if you haven't really thought about this or dug into it very much, is they'll like really drive home one section or one phrase and, and, and like really point that and try to get you down their way of thinking to where you almost, it, it gets really hard sometimes to think about it just openly and just look at it and be like, oh, because they're like leading you down that path. And you're like, oh yeah, that does look like a contradiction. It's not. It's, it's not that difficult to understand, but you know... Um, Every time I've seen anything that even looks like a contradiction in time, it always has been revealed Just oh, yeah, that's what that means. I just don't understand that properly. But in any case, I just wanted to bring that up because people will, will use that to attack the King James Bible. 
And of course, the, the modern perversions will go and they'll try to change that to make it so that it doesn't seem like a contradiction. But then what they're doing is, and especially in this instance, they'll just take like what the original texts say, what the, what the manuscripts say, and they'll just, just interpret that and change it because, well, it, can't, it couldn't have been that. That must have been a mistake. It has to mean something else because they just don't understand. And that's the liberties that they, they take in these perversions where they'll, they'll just say, because I can't understand this and this looks like a contradiction to me, it couldn't, it couldn't be like that. And then they just go and change God's word. Instead of just saying, well, I'm not perfect and I'm not God and maybe I don't understand everything about the Bible, but this is what's been preserved and this is what's been written and we're just going to translate it the same way as it's been, as it's been presented to us. So let's go back to Acts chapter 9. We're done in Acts 22. We're going to continue on here. We're going to jump down to... Um, let's jump down to verse number 20. Or verse number 19 says, And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Talking about Saul now. This event's over. He got baptized. You know, he had fasted for three days and three nights, not eating or drinking. So he was, he was pretty worn out. He's pretty wiped out, pretty tired. You don't have very much strength after three days of no bread, no eating and drinking. So it says, He received meat, he ate, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. I love this verse because if someone were asking you how long after you get saved should you wait to go out soul winning and go wait to preach that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I mean, a lot of people out there will say, well, you got to take classes, you got to be better, you got to do all these different things. You have to know the Bible before you go talk to anyone else. No. Straightway, it says in verse 20, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. See, here's the thing. If you are saved, you should know how you got saved. It shouldn't be that hard, right? I mean, you're saved because you put your faith in Christ. You know what you did to get saved. You know that you just believed in Christ. Now, you might not have all the answers. And should you study and learn a lot more and, and be willing and be able to give an answer to people and, and be more effective? And, you know, of course, continue to strive and work at it. But here's the thing. Straightway, Saul went out and preached. Straightway, the woman at the well, as soon as she talked to Jesus, she went out to other people and said, Hey, is not this the Christ? And she was trying to convince people, Look, this is the Messiah. This is Christ. The first thing she did was just go out and try to tell people, Hey, look, here he is. This is him. She didn't know a whole lot of necessarily about the Bible, but she's just going out and trying to get other people saved. Hey, once you get saved, you know how you get saved. Just, just share that. That's all you have to know to point other people to Jesus Christ. You don't have to know very much. Don't let, don't let the lack of Bible knowledge prevent you from trying to go out and, and witness other people and, and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't let that hold you back. God can use you, and God will, will, will purge, and, and, and he'll, he'll help you to understand more when you go out and just, just your, your willingness to serve him. You have a zeal to serve him. Hey, God likes to see that, and he'll use you, and he'll, you know what? He'll probably help you to understand things even faster. If he sees a willing servant, if he sees someone, hey, they don't know much, but they're not going to let that hold them back. They've got a desire. They want to get people saved. I'm going to open up that. Why wouldn't he? Why wouldn't he open up the scripture to you when he sees that? Of course he's going to do it. On the flip side, if he sees someone then, well, they're saved, but they don't really seem to be too interested. And yeah, they start reading the Bible, but I mean, they're not really doing anything. You know, if you're reading your Bible and you're praying, you know, and you're trying to clean up your life, God's going to open up his word to you. But I think he's just going to do it that much more if he sees you trying to do the work. And I, that's what I love where it just says straight way. I mean, he didn't wait for anything. And he didn't even like wait to go down. And it says, I think it's in this chapter, he didn't wait to like to go down and talk to the apostles that were before him, you know, to talk to Peter and James and John and like get their approval and like ask them how to do things. No, he just went out and started preaching Jesus. He didn't need permission from anyone else to go and do it. He just went and started doing it. And that's the right way to do it. Just if you got the Holy Spirit and you've got God's word, tell other people about Christ. Let's continue on here in the story. Verse 21 says, But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on the name of 
this name in Jerusalem, then this is where Saul's having a huge impact. Because you see someone who goes from attacking the church, from, from persecuting the church, from, from bringing people and, you know, and just putting them into prison, for believing what now he's just come to just do a 180 completely and just believe exactly what he was bringing people into, into prison for. That makes a big impact on people because he was making waves. He was making waves in cities. He was making waves among the church. His name was known. Ananias here in Damascus knew. He's like, hey, I heard about that guy. He's going to arrest me. And God said, no, no, he's not. No, I got, you know, I got a plan. I got this worked out. And when you see someone who just goes from completely being against it to now he's preaching it and, and persuading people, that's a big deal. That's, that, that gets a lot of people's attention. And that's another thing too. Your personal life ought to be a great testimony to God. Now we know that you don't have to give up your sins to be saved. But when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to bring a lot more honor and glory. People are going to take a lot more notice the more that you change, the more sins that you get out of your life. And you start thinking, like, you're going to look at you and be like, man, this guy really does believe the Bible. I'm going to take that seriously. People will be able to look at you and will you ever be perfect? No, of course not. But there should, you know, there should be a huge difference from the way that you are acting and behaving when you're in the world and doing all this other stuff from, the, from after that, when you decide to get serious and serve God. And, and, and just people seeing that and taking notice of that can have a big impact on people. And it had a great impact when people saw Saul going around and preaching Jesus Christ when he had just been condemning people for it. And it says um, in verse 22, But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. Verse 23, And after, this, and after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. So now the Jews... I mean, he was like their number one ally going out and persecuting the church. And now they're like, we got to shut this guy up. We got to kill this guy. Now he's on their hit list. But their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. So he's doing all these things in Damascus. And he's preaching Jesus. And he's, and he's preaching boldly, and he's, he's confounding them, and they want to kill him. Now he finally goes to Jerusalem. He escapes out of the city, but the people there are like, uh, no, because that's where he was. Remember, he was hailing men and women and then casting them into prison. So he'd like come and be like, oh, hey, you guys believers? Yeah, go, oh, and then arrest them, you know, like, like he was coming in like he was one of them and then, and then just arresting them. So now he's coming in being like, no, really, I got saved. And they're like, yeah, right, you know, like, like, we don't believe you. And they had good reason not to believe him, but ultimately then Barnabas, in verse 27, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way. So he tells them basically the whole story and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them, coming and going after them. So they finally accepted and said, okay, you know, Barnabas says, look, this is what happened. You know, Jesus Christ spoke to him in the way he went and got saved. He preached boldly, you know, like, like he's legit. This is for real. So they accept him in. And then in verse 29 it says, And he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him, which when the brethren knew, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him forth to Tarsus. So now it's like, I mean, everywhere he goes now, these people just want to kill him. Because they see the impact that he's having, the influence that he has, being someone who persecuted the church, to now preaching about Christ. Verse 31, Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and were edified, and walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost, were multiplied. So now the church begins to just, they get a break from their persecutions, because Saul is bringing all kinds of persecution their way. And you can really see here too, based on verse 31, when the churches have rest, it says they were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord, and in the cover of the Holy Ghost, they were multiplied. So now they're starting to grow again. Because, I mean, when the persecution's there, there's probably a lot of people who aren't going to want to join the church for fear of that persecution. And once that persecution lays off, now all of a sudden they're going to start growing again, 
because the weaker Christians, the weaker people who get saved are more likely to come to church. But this is the impact that one person had. Saul was spearheading this attack on the church and he was causing people, I mean, I believe he was causing people not to join the church. He was causing people to flee, to go underground, to be afraid, to live in fear. And he was doing great damage. But then on the flip side, this one person, and you'll see, I mean, when you look at the life of Paul, it's an amazing life. The impact that one person can have, I mean, is tremendous. So don't ever think that you can't do very much. One person with the right heart to serve God can have a huge impact and can do, I mean, you can move mountains. If God be for you, who can be against us? Just look at the life of Paul. Okay, there's nothing necessarily special about him individually that anybody else can't say that they can't be, they can't be used of God because, oh, well, well, Paul had this special gift or something. No. God can use any one of us to that extent. We just need to be ready and willing to, to, to let him use us and have the desire, have the zeal, have the fervency to do it. And Saul was never, he wasn't even a pastor of a church. He was more like a missionary. He was going around. He was helping church just get it, getting started. <clears throat> but he wasn't even a pastor. So don't think that, oh, well, maybe you can't be a pastor and say, well, I can't really have that much of an influence, so... You know, whatever. No, everybody can. If you're if you're a Christian, if you put your faith in Christ, you can have a huge influence just with your voice and and speaking to individuals and getting them saved. And if you have the right desire to do that, you can you can do all kinds of great things if you really just let God lead your life. Now we're going to switch gears here in the chapter, and we're going to finish up pretty quick here. Um, we're going to move a little bit away from Saul. Now we're going back to Peter, who's still performing these amazing miracles. And I'm not going to go through this the, the, like verse for verse for the rest of this chapter, but we'll skip down a little bit. To um, We hear about Aeneas here. He was sick of the palsy. Verse 34 says, And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ, make it thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately. So here... Again, I mean, the Apostle Peter is back to just performing his miracles, healing people that are sick. And look at verse 35. And all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. So what is that, what's happening here is that many people are end up getting saved as a result of these miracles that Peter's doing. Because God gave these miracles and God let them do these miracles for a sign. And they were a sign to people that don't believe so that they can see the great power of God. And be like, wow, and you know, and that must be of God. Then they end up getting saved as a result because they can see the power that he's that he's walking with, and and hear what he's preaching, and put their faith in God. And then it, the story ends up here at the end of the chapter with even a greater miracle than healing the person with sick of palsy. When he um, he brings back this woman, um, Dorcas was her name. It says by interpretation, Tabitha. Um, he brings her back from the dead. Like this woman, she was a Christian. She helped people out. I guess she made all these garments and stuff. People really loved her. They heard that Peter was in Joppa and they were real close to Joppa. So they send, they're like, hey, bring Peter over here. So they get Peter in there and they just explain, look, you know, how great she was. And, you know, people were weeping and they were showing him all the coats and garments which that woman had made. So he, he sends everyone out. He kneels down. He gets on his knees and he prays. And... This woman, um, and it says, And turning to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. In verse 41, right at the end of the chapter here, it says, And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. So we see here again, these events were monumental. I mean, these were huge events that everybody were hearing about. I mean, people would hear about this stuff. And then they'd end up getting saved as a result of hearing about this stuff. Now, this is amazing. These events are, are, are incredible that they happen because they're truly miraculous. And, and we don't understand sometimes how miraculous it is because we don't see this kind of stuff happening in our day-to-day -day lives. I mean, you don't just see people like, like, you know, they can't walk 
And now all of a sudden, you know, you know this person, you've never seen them walk, they've never been able to walk, and now all of a sudden they're walking again. I mean, if you really think about that happening, just think about someone that you know and just be like, that would be a crazy move. I would just be like, that's awesome. Like, that, it, would, it would have such an impact on you personally to know somebody and just, man, this happened. Yeah, this guy, I mean, you know, he's, he's a preacher and he, he just, you know, put his hands on it or whatever. And now all of a sudden they're just walking. I mean, it's, 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 it's incredible. These events, and these events were happening a lot back then. I mean, there's, the disciples were given this power. We read so many stories of people being healed. I mean, this woman was raised from the dead. She was dead. And, and, and he came in and, and brought her back to life. And it wasn't some medical thing. It was a power of God. And this reminds me, I was talking to a guy out soul winning the other day. And, you know, we have these monumental evidences in the Bible. It talks about these miracles. I mean, these miracles led people to get saved. Just hearing about them. And the thing is, there's the miracles of the Red Sea. When, when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, all those miracles that happened, look, these events are recorded in the Bible, and not even just in the Bible, like, like these events that happened are recorded in many other places, that, that these significant events in history happen, but they're recorded ultimately in the Bible, and this is the true source, because God's the one that did these things, and there's no other explanation for them whatsoever. It is impossible to deny that these miracles happened, and God gave us these miracles and these signs for a reason so that to help us to have the faith in him, to see, look, these things are happening and they're real. And I was talking to this other guy. And he said, well, what about all these other religions? Like, did you look at other religions? How do you know that, you know, your religion's right? And I tried to explain to him that even though that, you know, I believe the Bible, I believe it by faith. You know, it's not like you can prove to somebody and just sit down and write it out and be like, this is a fact because X, Y, and Z. You can't put a proof together like that. You have to take it by faith. But I also explained, look, it's not just completely blind faith of just pointing your finger around. You have, you have a whole bunch of religions on the table in front of you and you just go, I'm going to believe this one. That's not the way it works. Okay, we still have a brain and God has given us many evidences that ought to be enough to lead you to put your faith completely in Him and to trust on Him. Yeah. And um, you look at these miracles that happen. You look at, I mean, our entire, I was explaining this to him too. I mean, this guy had a pretty hard head. He, he, he did not want to hear this. But, um, you know, we're in the year 2014. What is the year 2004? 2000 years, 2014. Oh yeah, that's related to Jesus Christ. That's related to one man that was on this earth. Our entire calendar Two, over 2,000 years later is based on that one man. Everybody has record of Jesus Christ. Uh, you know, all the civilizations know about him because of how much of an impact he had because he is doing all these miracles, walking on water, feeding people, turning water into wine, raising people from the dead. I mean, raising people that is a pretty big deal. Word's going to get around about that. Okay, these are facts. These things actually happen. This is evidence. This is all the evidence that you should need to be able to say, yes, this is the true and living God. And not only that, I mean, the whole thing just makes sense. I mean, just the fact that we all know we've done wrong. Nobody's perfect. We all understand judgment. We all understand that there needs to be some kind of justice that when you do something that's wrong, it has to be paid for. It only makes sense. It only makes sense that we deserve a punishment for our sins. We can't make up for what we've done that was wrong. We can't make it better by doing good. No, we've done wrong. It needs to be paid for. And, and the only religion that has this atonement is the, the, the Bible. It's Jesus Christ. He paid for our sins. He's the only way. And, I mean, it just, it just makes sense. I don't I know. Obviously, it makes sense to me. I'm up here preaching, but... Um, <laughs> the um, you know we see these great miracles they were given and I'll use that as an example sometimes out so much, especially with some of the harder cases that people like don't want to believe and they don't understand why they should believe it's like well look the if the Bi the Bible's true the Bible talks about all these events that happen these events really happen and not only that like the book you know the book's either true or it's not 
Jesus either, you know, was a great man of God who did these miracles, and if you can, if you believe that the stories that are recorded about him are true, then why wouldn't you believe that the words that he said are true? And he said, I and my Father are one. He is the Son of God. He came down from heaven. I mean, he's either, the, the, he's either God in the flesh or he's a liar. There's enough other things that he didn't hear that ought to be able to prove to you, even using other books and other sources, that these events really happened and that Jesus was a real person and that these things happened. I mean, he had such an impact. Why is it so hard to believe that the people that were around him were able to write down his words and, and record this stuff and record the things that he said? And he did all these things and these things really happened and we have his words. He's either extremely wicked, try, claiming to be God in the flesh, and a liar, or he really is, or he was telling the truth, and he proved it by all the miracles that he did. It just blows me away by people just think like, oh, you believe in fairy tales, isn't it? It couldn't be, it couldn't be any more solid. I mean, the, the evidence is there. But um, let's bow right to have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the book of Acts. I thank you for all the evidence that you give us in general, just, just in this life. Like Romans 1 says, dear Lord, that um, we're without excuse. Your, your eternal power and Godhead is, is shown to us, even in just in nature itself. Dear Lord, we don't have an excuse. You've given us enough evidence, enough reason to believe that you exist and that Jesus Christ came and paid for our sins, dear Lord. We have the evidence. The people that choose not to believe they're just being willingly ignorant, dear Lord. And um, I pray that you would please just continue to, to bless this church. Lord, help us not to get caught up in false doctrine or be de deceived by people who try to correct the Bible or say that there's contradictions in the Bible, dear Lord. Um, I pray that you would please just give us all the boldness that, that Paul had <coughs> to go out and, and as he did immediately, just, just start preaching and teaching about Jesus Christ. And Lord... Um, we love you, as in Jesus' name we pray, amen.